Good. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Sumi said a, a second ago, my name is Professor Nick Norman. I'm a professor of chemistry here at the uh, University of Bristol. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you for 10 or 15 minutes or so um, about what I've shown here on, on this slide, chemistry and global challenges, why the world needs chemists. So this, this talk is actually an abbreviated version of uh, a so-called inspirational lecture that I gave to our new first year intake earlier this week. Um, we start them off with a few uh, inspirational lectures, as we call them, to just tell them a little bit about um, the subject of chemistry and why it's relevant uh, to the world. And, and the subject I've chosen for that is, is chemistry and its relationship to global challenges. Um, and, uh, and the second part of it there, why the world needs chemists. Um, it's not only chemists that the world needs, of course. So um, would you respect uh, my colleague here from physics and mathematics, the world needs physicists and mathemat mathematicians as well, uh, as well as other scientists and engineers. But uh, I'm just gonna concentrate on the role that chemistry will play in some of the global challenges uh, which we all face. So let's move on to the next slide here and I will start my, my laser pointer. So here we go, we're all aware, um, we could hardly be unaware of the global challenges uh, which we all face, uh, climate change uh, associated with global warming um, and the effect of pollution and environmental damage and loss of biodiversity and so on. None of us will be unaware of the, uh, of the profound challenges which we all face um, throughout the world and, and across all nations. Uh, and things are going to have to change. We're going to have to make some very, very substantial changes to what we do and how we go about uh, all sorts of things in our lives, how we generate energy, how we... Uh, well, how transport's going to have to change, um, healthcare, food, uh, all sorts of things like that. I can't focus on all of these today. I'm just going to focus on one particular topic. But many things are going to have to change. Um, and uh, you will know from your watching the news and so on in your own countries and, and across the world that uh, all sorts of activity is taking place and has been for a while. This logo down here is for the uh, so-called COP26 conference, which will take place in the UK in Glasgow, in fact, starting in just a few weeks' time, where leaders and others from nations across the world will meet uh, to agree new climate action plans uh, and so on. Many of the changes which we'll have to make, of course, will be economic and social changes, and I won't touch on those today, but um, we must also consider technological solutions to many of the problems we face. Um, and that's what I will focus on very briefly. I'll just take one particular um, particular area to look at. But the point I want to make is that for those of you that are considering studying chemistry, then chemistry will have a pivotal role to play in most of these technological solutions which we're going to have to develop over the coming years uh, and decades. So if we look at the uh, next slide here, I'm just going to focus on transport. Uh, so there are some very, very big changes, some profound changes that are going to have to take place in terms of transport, all aspects of transport, how we move ourselves around, how we move uh, freight and cargo around and so on. So if you look at that picture there, that's an electric vehicle being recharged from a, a public charging point um, in the UK. I think we, you may well have seen those and we're going to be seeing very much more of that. Uh, so as we transition from cars and smaller vehicles, which are currently driven by or powered by internal combustion engines, which burn fossil fuels, of course, which we're going to have to stop using, um, we're going to move uh, principally probably to electric cars. There's other modes of, of propulsion as well, and I'll, I'll cover some of those in just a moment, but it's, it's likely that the vast majority of cars will move from being powered by internal combustion engines, petrol or diesel, to being powered by a battery, which drives an electric motor. So if we just focus on batteries, batteries are electrochemical cells. So the clues in the name, there's chemistry there, electrochemistry. Um, and you may well be familiar with, with how batteries work basically from your studies in, in chemistry so far. But if we look at the, uh, the most common type of battery that is currently in electric vehicles and is likely to be used certainly in the foreseeable future, these are so-called lithium batteries, um, which have been around for a long time, although a Nobel Prize uh, for the development of these batteries was awarded only, only a couple of years ago, in fact. But lithium batteries have, um, uh, the charge carrier is lithium, um, which uh, cycles from lithium metal to lithium plus, and the cathode contains cobalt. It's a lithium cobalt oxide species. 
Um, and therein lies part of the problem because lithium, neither lithium nor cobalt are very abundant elements on earth. Uh, lithium is the third element in periodic table. It's a light element, but it's not actually that abundant. Um, and neither is cobalt. Uh, so quite apart from all the development work that we need to do to make batteries that will have many more charge cycles available to them and of course be much more easily recyclable, uh, part of which is a chemical process. Um, there's also a lot of research going on to seeing whether or not we can use so-called earth abundant elements uh, to replace elements like lithium and cobalt and so on. Um, most of the world, or about half of the world's cobalt comes from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. There are some issues, environmental issues in terms of how that is uh, uh, that is extracted and so on. But quite apart from that, the rarity of cobalt means that it would be very much easier if we could use the next element in the period or the adjacent element in the periodic table, which is iron. Iron is very much more abundant. Um, and uh, the world's never going to run out of iron. So you can see where some of the research in chemistry is, is, is going as far as batteries are concerned to use um, earth abundant elements, perhaps being able to replace cobalt with iron. And if we could replace uh, lithium with sodium, for example, sodium is very much more abundant as well. Now, there are challenges associated with doing that. Lithium and cobalt batteries uh, so far are much better than those involving sodium and iron. But you can see where some of the research still needs to take place if we're going to make batteries out of more earth abundant elements, quite apart from um, making sure that they're all fully recyclable as well. So that's just one of the challenges which we face um, in terms of transitioning from internal combustion engine cars to electric vehicles, electric cars. And chemists will play um, a key role in the development of, of batteries amongst other things in, as we make that transition. Now, uh, the next uh, bullet point I have down here is fuel cells. So let's look at this picture here. This, uh, this picture was in the news in the UK about just over a year ago. This is a prototype train currently testing on British, uh, on British railways, which is powered by hydrogen using a hydrogen fuel cell. So you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with a little bit about how batteries work. Um, they are charged and then the electrochemical process takes place um, from which we can draw a current. And in some cases for non-rechargeable batteries, that's all we can do. The electrochemical process is not reversible, so they can't be recharged. Much more commonly, we find rechargeable batteries, um, and that includes lithium batteries, of course, where um, we can connect them up to a circuit and they'll do electrical work um, and become discharged as they do so. But simply by reversing the current from an external source, we can recharge the battery because the electrochemical process that operates in the battery is reversible. Um, but nevertheless, batteries contain their own electrochemical fuel, if you like. Uh, a fuel cell is a little bit different. Uh, a fuel cell uses an external fuel, and in most cases, uh, oxygen from the atmosphere. So it's still an electrochemical cell, um, but one which in this case uses hydrogen. This is a so-called hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. And what happens there is that uh, electrodes catalytically um, oxidize hydrogen or split it into hydrogen and then separate it into a proton uh, and H plus and an electron. The electron goes around a circuit to do work to the other electrode uh, where it's combined with oxygen to reduce the oxygen, which combines with the H plus to form water. So a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell um, is uh, driven by hydrogen from the outside, oxygen from the air, and it keeps going as long as you provide it with fuel and it produces an electric current. And it's probably quite suitable for vehicles such as trains or heavy goods vehicles maybe. Um, but nevertheless, still a lot of work to do in terms of developing and optimizing fuel cells um, for transportation. Uh, many fuel cells have um, electrodes that are made of platinum, for example, which is an expensive and rare element. So research needed there in terms of how we can use cheaper electrodes um, and still have efficient fuel cells. As I've said, that train there runs, has a hydrogen oxygen fuel cell and it runs therefore on hydrogen as the fuel. Uh, and there are some challenges associated with, with using hydrogen. Um, we firstly, we have to generate it. Hydrogen, elemental hydrogen does not occur naturally on earth to any appreciable extent. So we have to make it. Um, and currently hydrogen is made uh, from natural gas, uh, a reaction with uh, natural gas, methane and steam, uh, which produces hydrogen, but it also produces a lot of carbon dioxide, much of which goes into the atmosphere. That's so-called grey hydrogen, which is why I've got a little grey HY here, um, because that produces a lot of carbon dioxide, which is a bad thing. 
So-called blue hydrogen, uh, hence the color blue here, uh, uses much the same process. Um, but the carbon dioxide that's produced is either sequestered um, in a geological reservoir or perhaps used for something else. Um, and or the reaction is run in such a way that instead of producing carbon dioxide, you produce elemental carbon soot, basically, which can then be disposed of and buried if, if need be. Very much better, however, if we can use green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is made by electrolysis of water, uh, which is very clean. You take water, you electrolyze it, you get hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and as long as your electricity source is, is green from renewables, then that is by far the best way of doing it. But this is all going to have to be developed on a much larger scale so that we have very, very efficient electrochemical cells that will take uh, electricity um, and generate hydrogen. So again, more of an interest there um, and activities for chemists, but also in terms of storage. Um, you have to store hydrogen. On a train like this, uh, it's stored in tanks as a compressed gas. It's not practical to run trains like this on liquid hydrogen. Um, but storing uh, hydrogen in, in cylinders as in a compressed form is suitable perhaps for lorries and certainly for, for trains. But there's a lot of research going on into other types of hydrogen storage materials, chemical materials that contain lots of hydrogen by weight, which if you heat them up will reduce or release, sorry, the hydrogen. It's all chemistry and uh, a lot of research going on in that area at the moment to make more efficient hydrogen storage materials, which will enable um, the more easy use of hydrogen fuel cells in certain types of transportation and so on. And uh, before we leave this slide, let me just uh, highlight lubricants as well. Um, you all know that engines, whether they're internal combustion engines or electric engines or whatever it is, need lubricants. Um, for electric vehicles, the, the strains in, in the transmission are a little different to internal combustion engines, so that requires different types of lubricants, and most lubricants are complex chemical formulations. And a lot of research going into new lubricants, which use, which are better, which are more efficient, um, which are designed for different types of vehicles that we're going to use. But even if we just design lubricants that last longer, um, if we could make engine oils, for example, uh, that last 50% longer then in the UK alone, that would save about 30 million gallons of uh, waste oil per year. Lubricants are all about formulation chemistry and the materials that go in there. So again, big challenges for chemists there in terms of making uh, better lubricants for the future. I'm gonna finish with this one here. We can't leave transport without considering aviation. Um, currently aviation produces about one to 2% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and it will be many decades probably before we can fully transition in aviation away from burning hydrocarbon fuels to either hydrogen power or electrical power. Um, for long haul aviation, batteries are simply too heavy and can't carry enough charge to get a plane any distance. And hydrogen, well, you can take a lot of it with you, but it has to be compressed in cylinders and, and so on currently, and that's heavy and expensive as well. So in the short term and perhaps the medium term, aviation is probably going to continue to use hydrocarbon fuels. Um, these should not be fossil fuels, of course. Um, and we need to use uh, the carbon, which makes up the hydrocarbon, needs to come from the atmosphere as CO2. And there are two ways of doing that. One is biofuels, where you take biomass and you ferment it into something like ethanol. Um, and then you need to convert that into something like uh, a bioaviation fuel. That's all chemistry, um, but the world needs much better catalysts to turn ethanol into bio hydrocarbon fuels or bio derived hydrocarbon fuels uh, if we're going to do this at scale. Uh, the other way to do it is using so called synthetic fuels, where we take carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere um, and react it with hydrogen, again, having to be green hydrogen um, to make uh, synthetic fuels derived then from atmospheric CO2 and green hydrogen to make uh, hydrocarbons that can. Uh, compare aircraft. In that case, it's more circular as far as the CO2 is concerned. There's still, the aircraft are still producing carbon dioxide, but that carbon dioxide is then taken back out of the atmosphere either to make more synthetic fuels or by plants to make more biofuels. And I'll just finish about composites. That aircraft there is a Boeing 787, um, which is the fuselage and much of the wings are made from composite materials, which are fiber reinforced resins. Um, a lot of research going into making better resins um, that are greener uh, in terms of the chemicals involved, but also which can be more easily recycled. 
And this is relevant not only to aviation, such as the Boeing 787, but to all those wind turbine blades that we see around us as well. They're all made of composites. They're not very easy to recycle. Um, and so there's a lot of research going on, which again is mostly chemistry into making composites that are much more easy to recycle. So that's just looking at transport. I could have chosen many other topics, energy, food, healthcare, the environment generally, and so on. But I just, uh, I've just looked at transport here. But what I hope I've shown you is that there are huge challenges ahead, which chemists will be playing an integral role in, in solving. And so if you're interested in chemistry and studying a chemistry degree, um, then you know, perhaps that's uh, inspired you a little bit in terms of uh, future careers that you might have working on some of these problems, which we're all going to need uh, to deal with um, if we're going to achieve uh, net zero emissions by 2050 or thereabouts. Okay, I'll finish there. Yeah, so my name's Jonathan Charmant. I'm a, I'm a chemist uh, as well. Uh, I have an office just down the corridor from from Nick in the uh, in the School of Chemistry here at Bristol. Uh, my specialist subject is shining X-rays at uh, crystals to work out what's inside them, to work out where all the atoms are, how the atoms are, are joined together to make, uh, to make molecules and what the molecular structure is and how those molecules interact with each other in, in a crystal. But I'm also the admissions tutor and I'm going to talk to you just for uh, 10 minutes about uh, how admissions work in the School of Chemistry, how our courses are structured in the School of Chemistry, just to give you an overview of uh, what we have on offer for you uh, in, uh, in terms of a chemistry degree. So we have uh, some three-year um, undergraduate degree courses, uh, and they are BSc uh, courses, and we have some four-year, uh, we call them integrated master's programs. Uh, they are called MSci uh, programs. And uh, it's an undergraduate qualification, uh, but the extra year and the extra um, content inside that degree program uh, makes it into a four-year MSci degree. And in terms of the way in which our courses are structured, uh, in years one and two, you get uh, an awful lot of your core chemistry teaching then, plus some uh, extra optional units uh, that you can study. Uh, and so one of those optional units in the first year, for instance, is a unit in uh, big ideas in science. And big ideas in science include those global challenges, uh, one of which uh, Nick was, was talking about just now, as subject material and uh, thinking about how chemists and scientists in general should should rise uh, to those global challenges and solve those global challenges. Uh, we have some fantastic teaching laboratories here, world class teaching laboratories in which uh, we help you to develop your practical chemistry skills uh, alongside the, the other teaching that we give. And our courses diverge in year three between the various courses that we have on offer. So if you're a BSc student, then the final year, uh, you'll be doing uh, some core and specialized uh, units or modules alongside a, a research project or an educational or schools project in your final year. So the th year three of the BSc, clearly the final year and a project forms a major part of that. For other courses, uh, year three, uh, you might uh, be on an MSI course or you're staying in Bristol, in which case you'll do some advanced teaching laboratories alongside your uh, chemistry uh, units. Um, and then there are a set of courses where you go away from Bristol uh, into uh, industry uh, for a year's industry placement or to an overseas university, uh, either an in English speaking uh, overseas university or we have some connections with European universities as well and study chemistry at that university uh, away from Bristol for a year as part of a study abroad uh, program. And then all of our MSI students come back in, in the final year, the year four, uh, and carry out a major research project as part of their final year. So that's how our courses are structured. In terms of the themes that we have that run throughout all of our courses, all of our programs, uh, we uh, climate is a big theme uh, very very important to to chemists and everybody else i think uh, so problems that have to be tackled to do with climate change and chemistry has an awful lot to say about those uh, energy which nick mentioned uh, plastics plastics are fantastically useful uh, on the slide here the plastics are being used to uh, help students understand how molecules are put together so those modeling kits we find very very useful in, uh, in chemistry 
But what happens to plastic after we've finished using it? How do we dispose of plastic? Is plastic the fantastic substance that everybody thought it was in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you know, 50 years ago? Uh, or is it uh, an evil thing that we, that we now need to deal with? And uh, we, we start to answer questions about that in chemistry as well. Of course, chemistry has a lot to say about healthcare. We're developing new drugs. Uh, if we're developing uh, our understanding of things like the spike proteins in a virus, say, uh, like in COVID, for instance, that's, that's something chemists have an awful lot to say about too. And just in uh, applying technology, Nick uh, talked about battery technology, whole range of different technologies that chemistry impacts on, including nanotechnology. So those themes run throughout our programs as our programs and courses are designed to address those challenges that, that chemists are here to help solve in the world after they finish doing their degree with us. And in some senses as well, uh, whilst they're doing their degrees, whilst they're doing their research project. So fantastic teaching laboratories you will find here. We've got some uh, world leading digital teaching tools to help you develop your, your skills, uh, particularly in the laboratory. So we have some uh, tools there that help our students to understand how to do an experiment before they go into the lab. So to practice doing an experiment online, familiarize yourself with the equipment before you get into the lab so that you can be confident when you're in the chemistry lab environment. Uh, and, uh, and operate safely and effectively in that environment. Uh, we have world-class uh, chemists here, um, who uh, most of whom are very, very active in, in research. And the education that we're offering you is informed by the research, by the new things that we're discovering here in the School of Chemistry every day. Uh, lots of different programs. I've mentioned uh, already the various options you have program-wise to study in, in your third year and uh, some fantastic lecturers and tutors who won awards, not just for their research, but also for the teaching that they've carried out. Uh, our students have uh, all sorts of opportunities beyond their confines of their chemistry program uh, to develop their skills. Uh, going abroad in your uh, third year is, is an example of that. Uh, we have something called Bristol Futures, which is something that applies across the whole of the university, which helps to develop all sorts of skills uh, that uh, you uh, will find useful to you as you uh, move forward from your degree in, into employment or whatever it is that you want to do next. And uh, the placements that we have with our industrial partners, I'll talk about that in, in a moment's time. We've got a couple of new undergraduate courses that you might uh, find interesting uh, that are linked to computing and uh, computing in a scientific context, of course. So chemistry, if we're thinking about uh, computing that is uh, useful to chemists, we're thinking about scientific computing. And uh, as well as a chemistry with scientific computing program, there's also physics with scientific computing programs available as well. And if you're interested in, in uh, computing, in coding, and you're also interested in chemistry or physics, then those are some very attractive programs to perhaps think about. So industrial placements, I've put a few uh, on, on this slide here of the companies that uh, we've recently placed students with uh, throughout the UK and sometimes a bit beyond the UK as well. So Bayer Crop Science, for instance, is in Germany. We placed some students in, in Germany there uh, to go and work uh, with, with Bayer for, for a year there. Uh, fantastic uh, experience if that's what you want to do in your third year to go away and become an employee of one of those companies, uh, working on the chemistry research that those companies are carrying out, helping to solve relevant, uh, very pertinent industrial problems uh, that, uh, that those companies are involved in solving. Uh, when our undergraduate students finish their degree, they are very successful in going forward into all sorts of different careers. And this is where I'm going to finish. So our um, graduates are uh, highly targeted amongst major employers. So in the UK, uh, the leading employers, the people who employ uh, lots and lots of, of graduate students from university, where the, uh, we were the number four most targeted university uh, in a recent survey of, uh, of universities and, and where their students go. Our students are uh, amongst the highest paid in the country, certainly graduating chemistry students uh, compared to graduating chemistry students from other UK institutions uh, tend to do better in terms of their uh, remuneration, their, their pay uh, than, uh, than uh, students from other Russell Group universities within the UK. 
lots and lots of possible career destinations. So, of course, if you want to, you can go and work in the chemistry industry when you finish your chemistry degree. And uh, that's a, an obvious career path. But there are lots of other employers who are very interested in employing people who have the transferable skills that a chemist or indeed a physical scientist uh, would gain from doing an undergraduate degree. So people like uh, financial services, for instance, uh, the big financial services firms like Deloitte and KPMG um, are very interested in employing uh, people who have those transferable skills, who have mathematical skills, who have communication skills alongside that, who can think practically about solving problems. Uh, those are people who are very, very useful to, to those sorts of employers. And uh, we offer lots and lots of support in helping our students to find the right employer to transition into employment at, at the end of their degree. And that's supported by, by Bristol Futures, that uh, overarching program that we have across the university as well. So I hope I've given you a flavor of, uh, of what chemistry at Bristol is all about, how it's structured and how the different programs operate. There's lots and lots more information on our, on our website. So just type Bristol Chemistry into, into your browser and you'll get straight to, to us. Uh, you'll be able to find out much more about what's going on here than I could possibly describe in just a, a few minutes. Uh, and you'll have plenty of uh, opportunities to contact uh, us there to uh, find out a little bit more about chemistry, if that's what you'd like to do. So I'm going to finish there. Uh